G'day guys, I'm Tim Tam here. In this tutorial, we'll be going through the rotoscoping techniques that's used in films, TV shows, and even personal projects. Uh, I don't believe there's much tutorials on YouTube that goes in depth um, in terms of shortcuts, uh, interface layouts, as well as previewing your rotoscope in the best possible way. Um, so I'll be going through the different techniques. Each technique will have a timestamp to it so you can uh, skip any irrele irrelevant information. I'll also be posting up any scripts I've personally made, as well as the footage you see here, which was shots um, for a personal project um, uh, that I filmed for. Um, this is with the Blackmagic, also filmed with my camera, which doesn't look as good as the Blackmagic, but we'll be working on the Blackmagic footage. Be sure to uh, donate if you can. All donations are much appreciated since I can, since uh, AdSense has been disconnected from this channel. Um, and please be sure to leave a comment if you would um, support a Patreon since I'm still trying to get as much survey data as possible to invest time um, into the Patreon. Uh, so without further ado, let's get into it. So the first thing you should do whenever you're rotoscoping is to set your project format and frames per second to the footage that, you're, that you are rotoscoping for. If you have to scale your rotoscope, or if you have to correct it to the proper format, it will, like 80 times out, 80 times, 80% 80 of the time, it will not work and your mask will be broken. Um, I've seen people do this, I've done it myself back in the day. Um, I'll be lying if I haven't done it a few times from a small projects here and there. It does not help. So this um, DPX sequence is uh, 1080. Um, so it's 1920 by 1080, and the frames per second is 23 frames per second. Uh, so to do that, um, I'm sure you know this, however, since this is mostly for intermediate, but if you don't know this, go into the properties, uh, which is here, and set it to 1080, and the frames per second to 23 for this sequence. Next thing that we have to do is to set up your workspace. The default, um, I'm working on two monitors at the moment, so the main screen here is my viewer. Um, the default would mostly look like this, but in the compositing section. What you want is to have your workspace to be the main viewer. You'll be very rarely be using your uh, node graph here, and you'll be rarely using the options um, which can easily be a float menu. So um, I, so I usually work with uh, getting rid of the curve editor, getting rid of the dope sheets, making these floats, and uh, making them disappear for a while. Closing this, uh, putting this down here. This is if you're working on one monitor. I rarely, very rarely use one. Have your node graph here. So you can see it and your main footage here. So once you have a interface that resembles this, uh, you can also uh, get rid of the options also. You don't really need those at the moment. And you're also going to split up your viewer um, horizontal and within the horizontal you're going to be using the uh, vertical. Now why you're doing this is for multiple reasons. These two new viewers will be your grey and uh, red previewing that we'll be going into very shortly. So if you have uh, one monitor, this um, workspace is very well. If you want to work on an object or this head, you can have that going uh, as well as these two going. You can uh, access all the fine crevices or the pixel detail for it. Um, if you're working on two monitors, um, I would have uh, the node graph on its own separate monitor with these three viewers taking up the whole entire space. This will greatly improve your workflow compared to working with the default with all that clutter in the way. So the next step is setting up your frame range. Your frame range is your uh, sl time slider here. Um, since the sequence is pretty much the frame range itself, uh, to get rid of any daunting tasks, uh, if you need to only rotoscope a section and you can't have your own separate um, 
if you can't render out your own separate sequence just to that one section, it's always good to set up your uh, rotoscoping frame range uh, just for peace of mind. Um, and it has the stop and ending uh, clear in front of you. You're not going to be skipping or missing a frame or shapes turning off a few frames early. It will definitely help you speed up your workflow. Alright, so once you have your footage loaded, which is this sequence, um, or your interface is set, or the project settings and frame range and frames per second is set, um, the first thing to do is not to make your shape or to you know get your rotoscoping out, it's to loop the footage as much times in real time as possible to visualize what shapes need to be made, what um, areas you have to look out for, um, if you can track the shape or if, if it will be more um, in your best time interest to just do it frame by frame. So the head can uh, stay as one shape, um, I can track the symbol, um, I could probably get away with automatic tracking but I think I might be skitting out a bit so I'm going to have to manually do it right about here. It might uh, track the background, which we don't want, obviously. Um, and the next will be the leg for the tutorial purpose, and I can automatically see straight away that uh, it's going to have to be broken up into several different shapes. So that's going to be one shape, one shape, one shape, one shape. Well, that's definitely going to be one shape. It's clothing, so clothing's never easy for rotoscoping. The heads, um, I could probably keep it with one shape since it goes from that shape to that shape to that shape. Very little warping, very stationary throughout. I can definitely get away with one shape for that. And for any other stuff, um, the rifle, I don't have to really worry about the stock because I'll be behind the body shape. Uh, for the arm, I don't have a. I only need to have a separate shape for this arm and this arm since it is hiding behind the body. Uh, probably going to have to break it up into two different shapes. Uh, I could probably get away with it. Um, so always loop, loop your footage as much as possible, visualize it as much as possible, which should only take about five minutes. Note take to set out what you have to do, since in some cases um, a full body, a full body rotor for this would, it would have to be finished within two days or possibly one day, if it's pretty in crunch time. Uh, once you've looped it, there's, there's usually a good saying when doing rotoscoping. Use as less points as possible, less shapes as possible, and to see what can and cannot be tracked. It's all making your life as uh, less hard as possible when doing your rotoscoping or mats producing. So the next stage now is to set up your roto. Now, when you're setting up your roto, I'm just bringing up my my node scrap my node graph here. When setting up your roto, which is the O button, um, it's always good to label it. You don't know how awesome it is to have stuff labeled when you're working in scripts that are like imagine this whole entire area just full of nodes. It it it, get, it honestly gets to that level. So you uh, label it head. Uh, label this head since this will be the head mostly. Uh, after your roto node, put down a B for blur and an erode filter. Um, so why do we do the blurring and the filter? Well, you can you can feather your roto in your feathering settings. However, it's very restrictive. It's very um, it can be very Cluttered once you're in a once you have to finish this mat within you know a day or two you have to go back to the roto go to the feather you have to keep in the feather where with the blur it's its own separate node um, you can, it's easily accessible you have sort of a little bit more control um, if you want to copy it um, if you want to single out the head um, if you want to access the keyframes it's not with the other keyframes with the actual shape morphing and animation it just makes your life a whole ton more better. Um, be sure to put that to the alpha. And the filter road, um, you can, uh, the filter road, uh, once connected to the alpha, you can shrink or grow your the actual rotor shape itself 
without messing up the keyframes. Um, it, this is very, very handy when you're doing off-the-cuff rotoscoping. And it can fix small areas um, here and there. Although it's not something good to rely on since it averages out everything, it can definitely help if, let's just say, you've you found a really good key spot where you can just change the whole entire shape to the left, but that's just two pixels out. So in instead of selecting all the points, sizing it up, just get the erode, put it to 0 0.23, and the whole entire shape's covered. It will definitely make your life a lot more easier. Okay, so now that the uh, node script is all um, set up, um, we'll be tracking this shape. Um, we don't have to track the leg, which will be done, which we'll be doing after. So um, get a track around. Add your track. Put it to the head. Now, since the head move is moving, I'm going to put it here. Keep the uh, press control to have free free move the points. Make the uh, thing very big. Um, you can click you can click the rotate option in the options uh, just to get more extra data, but not much point. Um, and yep, let's hit play. I start in the middle, which is, I should have done that, but let's play back. And if it freaks out, we have to readjust. Surprisingly, it's staying pretty consistent. Okay, so once that's finished tracking, you have a good stable track. Guy Richie over here. Um, uh, then uh, you can export that. Um, since if you use a tracker itself, it uh, just bogs down the scene too much. So in the export, go to match move, create, or you can go to bake if you even if you think that this node itself is too bottleneck for you, um, and put that 